always lived in the city of Detroit and pretty much I always will because I love the city. It was part of my dream, you know, to live in this area by getting a nice, big, pretty home and renovating it myself. When they now said I was the winning bidder, you should have saw me. I said, oh my God, you should have saw me. I was like jumping up and down. <laughs> I was ecstatic. If you don't participate on it, you're going to wish one day later that you would have. All across the nation, people are trying to figure out what do you do post-industry, you know, or, or what do you do with vacant lots in a city? And Detroit is leading example of what to do. Growing up in the city of Detroit, on the east side of Detroit, I've been in Detroit all my life. I wanted to help clean the city up, wanted to make sure that the city was good because this was my city. The mayor came up with the idea that he was going to have the street sweeping program come back, and since he's brought it on, it's brought in more employees, people will be finding jobs, people are really excited. It feels so great to really see the city of Detroit making such a great turnaround and me being a part of it. I'm just looking for things in the city of Detroit to get greater and greater. Since the park has been done, we have doubled the amount of children that is coming in the park. The children would go out somewhere else to do the park. They didn't want to go to a rundown park. But now they can come right into the city, right into their own neighborhood. It makes the neighborhood housing value go up. I feel wonderful, you know, once I signed that lease and knew I was in here, you know, I took my girls down there and they was happy, you know, and then we came and seen the place. We did the ribbon cutting with the mayor. It was just so exciting, you know, it's so family friendly here. It's like a hustle vibe that I think Detroit has. You know, you see everybody on the go. You see everybody up and going and everybody going to get it like a, a go-getter city, you know? It seemed like no matter what, Detroit, we keep on fighting. I don't think you find that nowhere else. There's energy. People are getting beyond the stigmas of the past and venturing back into the city. And the people who have stayed here, even through the rough times, there's a true opportunity for those people to participate. I think that it's a great time in Detroit. You'll find so many opportunities because there's, there's room in Detroit for everyone. I'm actually moving into the building that my grandparents first lived in when they moved to Detroit from Texas. With so many great things happening, I wanted to be a part of it, and if not now, then never, so I decided to jump in. There's so many resources a city of Detroit youth can get now, which is great. It's, it's a lot of different than it used to be, and they won't just be limited to one or two things. They can have a wide range, a variety of different things. I just know I had better for myself. I just know there's so many opportunities out here that there's no point in wasting time. Waking up and knowing that you did something, knowing that you did something. Coming back to the city right now at this time is the best. Every day they're making new strides. So it's something that I look forward to and being part of. Detroiters are staying now. It's like a land of opportunity now. Detroit is back. Ladies and gentlemen, our mayor, Mike Duggan. I've got my uh, notes here, and we've already uh, started uh, this process. Uh, we do something in the city now uh, that uh, we haven't historically done, and that is the mayor and the council and the clerk sharing the stage together. The last four years you've gotten used to this, but it used to be the mayor was up here and the council, if they were there, were somewhere out in the audience, but if you look at what we've dealt with together, it has been a partnership, uh, and it was the only way we could succeed. And this is a time for me to acknowledge uh, the partners uh, who have made everything good happening in the city possible. Uh, and let's start with our council president, Brenda Jones. A 
great voice for affordable housing, the president uh, pro tem, Mary Sheffield. We have the council member with the toughest job of all. She has stepped in and taken over the budget uh, with all of about four weeks to get it done, doing a great job, council member Janae Ayers. Man who knows every nook and cranny in the first district, every block club, he's there, James Tate. One of the most respected police officers in the Detroit Police Department and our newest council member, Roy McAllister. Our strongest voice on everything related to economic development, council member Scott Benson. The man behind the affordable, how the, the, uh, the rental ordinance, the new uh, rental enforcement ordinance, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. The man in charge of the rental enforcement ordinance and the cameras uh, in the gas stations, uh, a great innovator from the east side, Councilman Andre Spivey. the single hardest fighter I've ever met in my life for everything she believes in, council member uh, Raquel Castaneda Lopez. <laughs> One of the uh, best public officials uh, this uh, state has ever had uh, was former state representative, state senator and county commissioner, uh, Burton Leland. And we uh, unfortunately uh, lost Burton last week, uh, but I know he's just enormously proud of the outstanding public servant his son has become, Council Member Gabe Leland. And our great county clerk, Janice Winfrey. So the other thing that we've done that you know, uh, our outstanding city clerk. Okay, so Alexis wants me to read this speech off a teleprompter. She might be right. Uh, <laughs> that probably isn't the last mistake I'm going to make uh, tonight. So uh, sorry, uh, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, so the other change in tradition that we made besides the mayor freelancing on uh, introducing the elected officials is that we started to move... Uh, the state of the city around in different areas. We went out to uh, the old Redford Theater and it was extremely well received. Then we went over uh, to the east side, to Second Ebenezer Church, uh, and uh, I really wanted to come to Southwest Detroit. Uh, and in particular, I got some folks here. I know uh, people from uh, Southwest uh, feel like they're not always remembered, but I could not forget because uh, here at Western High School. Uh, my grandmother, Mabel Kelly, graduated in the class of 1909. Uh, this was her neighborhood. And she got her love of learning here at Western. She went on to what we now know as Eastern Michigan University, became a school teacher in the Detroit public schools uh, for many years, got married uh, next door uh, at Holy Redeemer Church. This was a neighborhood uh, that has strong roots in my family. That was uh, about 100 years ago. More recently, my mother in the 1990s uh, was head of a nonprofit called Life Direction that dealt with trouble use. And she placed herself in this building at Western International High School where she was here every day with teenage girls dealing with their issues and their problems. She felt like she needed to be uh, where those who needed her the most were. Uh, and I would hear stories night after night from my mom uh, on what our young people were going through. Uh, and I think about uh, my grandmother who saw Detroit through a lot of good days, my mom being down in this neighborhood uh, in tougher days, but it's interesting what one person can do. So my mother uh, looked at all these kids with nothing to do after school. A lot of uh, 
people living in this part of the area are immigrants from countries where they uh, deeply valued soccer. So she went out and decided she was going to start a soccer league. And she recruited this young soccer player by the name of Tim Ritchie. And she said, I want you to come in and start a soccer league in Detroit for Life Directions. Well, 20 years later, Tim Ritchie's at a pal. He built that beautiful facility at Michigan and Trumbull. And we now have 2,000 uh, young people playing soccer. So when I come back to this neighborhood, I think about what it's meant over the years. When I walk into Holy Redeemer Church, I always stop in the back of the church because my grandma saved her money from being a school teacher and her church was so important to her, she paid out of a school teacher's salary for the Stations of the Cross that are still in that church. And you can go in the back of that church now and the plaque's there. Stations of the Cross donated by Mrs. Patrick Duggan back in the, uh, the 1920s. This community has been very important uh, for people's dreams for a long time. And so I want to say to uh, the uh, principal here, uh, Angel Garcia, and to the Western High School community, uh, thank you very much uh, for hosting me. Dr. Vitti, thank you uh, for the introduction earlier. And uh, this is going to be maybe a kind of a state of speech you're not really used to. It's not going to be a lot of rhetoric and stuff. It's going to be a lot of substance. And I really want to talk to, to the people of Detroit and say, we have a clear direction of where we want to go in the next four years. And I'm going to talk to you today in great detail about what I see. But you have to start with where we come from uh, and uh, the people who are making it possible. And at this point, I'd like to ask the men and women of this city's cabinet to stand up uh, and be introduced. They're working 80-hour weeks. They're doing a great job. Uh, for our 18 members of cabinet, please stand up. Thank you for your service. So, where do we come from? The numbers, I still can't get my mind around. The 10 years before I was elected, this city lost 244,000 people in 10 years. And so, how big is that? Uh, we lost 26%. That same decade, the city of New Orleans had Katrina. The city largely flooded. In the same decade, New Orleans had Katrina, New Orleans only lost 17% of their population. That's how devastating the financial and services crisis was to this city. And if you look at the 10 largest populations, cities in uh, Michigan today, Detroit's the largest, goes down to Livonia, you know what the second largest city would be? The people who left Detroit in 10 years. They would constitute the second largest city in Michigan. That's what we're dealing with. And so that many people left, it left behind a city with the highest unemployment rate in the United States. It left behind the highest poverty rate, the highest murder rate, uh, and left us in a position where we were unable to pay our bills. Uh, and so uh, when I was sworn in four years ago, uh, we were still losing 1,000 people a month. And when I stood here four years ago, I said this, give us six months. And people thought I was crazy. What are you going to do in six months? But we had to stop the exodus because when you're losing 1,000 people a month, there's no way to run a city. I just said, I think we can get the street lights out. I think we can get the police to show up. I think we can get the grass cut in parks. Just pause. And I want to talk today to those of you who stayed. And that was a great majority because that departure has slowed to a trickle. And I want to talk today about what you're going to see because you did stay. And I'm going to start with the future with the ones who have been most forgotten in the last decade, uh, and that is our children. It seemed like every time there were budget cuts, what happened? Schools were devastated, parks were closed, rec centers were closed, youth programs were cut back, uh, and a huge portion of those 244,000 people who left were parents with school-age kids. Uh, so we're going to start today by saying to the children, we want you to stay. And for those who did stay, we make a real commitment. And the first commitment we made was that every Detroit child who graduates from a high school in Detroit will have college guaranteed to be paid for. That's a Detroit promise, and we've implemented that.
we became the first major city in America with a college tuition guarantee. And today, we have 1,180 kids enrolled today in college under the promise, 723 in community college, 459 in four-year universities. And I want to say thank you to Sandy Brewer, the Detroit Regional Chamber, Governor Rick Snyder, Rich Baird, and the whole team that raised the money to get this started. That was remarkable. With the actual city council, a little bit of all the property tax growth that everybody here paying goes into the school, just perfectly. So children who are 8, 10, 12 years old know that if they study hard, the Detroit promise will be there for them. And so what it means is this, that we are going to make sure that our kids not only go to school, they succeed at school. Because across the country, particularly at college, community college, dropout rates are astronomical. When we saw this was a problem, we added coaches who follow our young people to college. And here's what they found. Last year, 63% of the kids who started the first year of community college made it to the second year because these coaches doubled the national average. Our kids are succeeding. And in the four-year schools, and I know I see President Roy Williams here, where they're having great success at Wayne State, 89% are doing this. We have smart kids who just need the opportunity. And so for our high school seniors, uh, you're graduating this May. Sign up now. Go to DetroitPromise.org. If you're accepted to a community college, you have two years tuition guaranteed. If you got a 3.0 grade point average and a 21 on your ACT, four-year university tuition guaranteed. And as one of our supporters likes to say, anybody thinking about selling their house in Detroit, after you put the Century 21 sign on your front lawn, you ought to put another sign that said, with this house comes a free college education, because that's what it means to be in the city of Detroit. I talked to Dr. Vitti, and I said, what can I do to be helpful? He said, the biggest thing we need right now is our career technical education program. It's uh, just been devastated over the years. And so we put together a partnership. Uh, with Jerry Anderson and DTE and the Ralph Wilson Foundation. Got $10 million in donations to rebuild the Randolph Center. All new equipment. And now our young people are learning electrical and plumbing and carpentry. And next year, are going to add robotics and welding. We're doing it right here in the city of Detroit. <laughs> 300 kids enrolled this fall, 400 more next year. And in the fall of 18, we're going to raise another $9 million for the Bright Hub Center for all of these programs. So those who don't want to go to college or maybe want to go later have another career. And thank you to Quicken for the million dollars that got us going. But the biggest thing I want to talk to you about right now is the role of the mayor in the support for public education. Because in this city, we have today 198 schools, 112 DPSCD and 86 charter. And I have said many times, I believe in choice. I think we need to have quality DPS schools and we need to have quality charter schools. And I am going to support uh, both of those. And so uh, Tanya Allen and, and 150 uh, volunteers just came out with some recommendations and they asked the mayor to get involved. So last week, I'm not imposing myself on anybody, I invited all our charter operators and Dr. Iris Taylor, the president of the school board, and Dr. Vitti, and we had a meeting. And I said, let's talk about whether you want me involved. And, if, and I'm only going to act if you want me to. And here's the first thing. Parents need to have information to choose their schools. Well, there used to be something at Excellent Schools Detroit that fell by the wayside. The state was supposed to do something which hasn't been done. And so I said, what if we do this? What if we got representation from DPS and the charters, from the parent community and academics, and we put out report cards that parents could rely on every year we did it together, so parents had a basis for comparing. Would you all support that? And they said, if the state gets behind that, we'd like to have you play that role. It was very interesting. I've got this most fascinating meeting. It's almost historic. They're getting along. And, you, and I'll show you the reason why the meeting went so well. Because 32,000 Detroit children today attend school outside of the city. 51,000 today go to DPSCD. 35,000 attend charters. And 32,500 children got up this morning and went to school in a school in the suburbs. And that says that what we're doing is not working. And so what I 
uh, whether the parents feel we don't have good enough quality schools, whether it's transportation, I'm not sure. And as we point out, there are some good transportation systems. We look at that. that. Isn't that a great school bus system? Covers the whole city of Detroit. That school bus system is the River Rouge Public Schools school bus system. I'm going to say that again. That little green in the bottom is the three square miles of River Rouge. And they run 200 miles of bus routes through the city of Detroit every day. Now, leave aside the education policy of the state uh, that encouraged that. My question is, why is it working? And so what I've said to the DPS and the charters is, it's working because we're not working together. We've got lots of schools who are nearby who could share resources. And so I said, let's take an area in northwest Detroit, say Southfield, Livernoy, and Fenkel to 8 Mile. Uh, and we've got about a dozen charter and DPS schools. Let's have a combined bus route that serves both of them. And maybe it looks like this. This isn't a final route, but it gives you an idea of how the bus route could work. They do this in Denver. We'll fund it a third with philanthropy, a third through the city, a third through the schools. And here's how it'll work. You, if you live in this part of northwest Detroit, you can go to any one of these eight schools or ten schools. You walk or ride to the nearest school, you get on the bus, and it can take you from the Detroit Achievement Academy on the west side over to Bagley if they've got a math program that you like. You can choose any school in this area. We'll run the buses in two directions uh, so that the ride won't take too long, and we're going to make a commitment to five years. We're going to make choice available so they're not being bused an hour away to River Rouge. And they said, we like that idea, but it's not enough. One of the problems we have is we got parents who get home from work at 5 o'clock, but their kids get out of school at 3. We need a place for these children to go. What if everybody on this loop got together? Your loop's got the Northwest Activity Center. Uh, what if you ran licensed daycare after school? The child could get on the bus, ride to the Northwest Activity Center, stay there till 5 or 5.30 in a safe environment, ride their loop back. And now every school has that program. And then another one said, well, wait a minute, that's not enough. We can't run eight different robotics programs, but what if we came together and had after-school programs like robotics or software programming, uh, art or music? And somebody said, how about if we just help the kids with their homework? What if we all came together and provided those kinds of after-school programs on these routes? And so this is the concept we're talking about. We're shooting to get it done this fall. I don't know if it'll be six schools or 12 schools, but I can tell you from the enthusiasm that if we could get DPS and the Charter working together and collaborating. We can provide good choices right here in the city of Detroit. And my role is going to be to support them, not to choose sides between them. And if this works, we're going to replicate these routes in one area after another in the city so you never again have a kid riding an hour on a bus to go to another location. <laughs> one of uh, the other programs, of course, is Grow Detroit's Young Talent, and what do the kids do during the summer? And I want to thank all of our business community and the like, uh, but you can, 8,000 kids enrolled last summer. Uh, if your company wants to hire us, go to gdyt.org. If you're a child who wants to sign up, we've got summer jobs with career tracks for you. So you're going to be covered not just during the school year, but during the summer as well. Of course, one of the biggest issues we face is making Detroit safer. Uh, and I want to talk in some detail about our plans to reduce gun violence. And everything starts with the officers that we've lost in the last two years that we're never going to forget. Captain Ken Style, Corporal Myron Jarrett, Wayne State Sergeant Colin Rose, and this last month, Officer Glenn Doss Jr. Uh, and Officer Darren Weathers. And we never forget uh, Officer Waldus Johnson, who's still in a coma in fighting for his life, they sacrificed for something they loved to make this city safer for everybody. And the reason they did it is they know that we're making progress. They know that they made a difference. And I'm just somebody who goes by facts. And here were the homicides in 2012, 386, highest homicide rate in the country. It went down to 332. And then last year, 267. We're down 30% in the last five years. We're no longer the highest homicide rate in the country, but it's nothing to be proud of because now we're not talking about who's the highest. We're talking about the national standards. Washington, D.C. had 116 homicides last year. Boston had 49. Washington, D.C. and Boston have populations almost the same size as ours. 
Okay, every city in America does not live with this violence. But we went to Boston, which succeeded on a program called Ceasefire. We brought it here, and I want to talk to you about it tonight in some detail. You might have heard a little, uh, but we've been running it, uh, talking directly to the criminals. We haven't so much talked about it in public. But let me tell you what we've done. We took two precincts on the east side, precincts five and nine, and we start putting in dedicated gun units of 10 to 12 officers, gathered gang intelligence just on that, and we uh, had a concept of group responsibility. We almost always know which groups are beeping with each other. And if one group's involved in a shooting, we put those 10 to 12 officers on everybody related to that group. We got coordinated law enforcement across all fronts. Uh, I'm really pleased to see Matthew Schneider here tonight, the U.S. attorney. The U.S. attorney in Detroit in the last five years has had the best record in America in busting local drug and gun gangs. And I appreciate the ongoing commitment. But we're partnered with Kim Worthy and the prosecutor's office, the State Department of Corrections. We all work together. And then every couple of months, we bring in 30 people that we think are likely uh, violent offenders. We bring them into a church. And the U.S. attorney and the prosecutor and I sit and talk with them. And these are the so-called ceasefire call-ins. And we say to these individuals, we have a lot of law enforcement coming after you if you commit a crime with a gun. We also have resources for you. We've got job training. We've got school. We've got help with your driver's licenses. Uh, and it's a very powerful evening. For an hour, we talk about the choices of prison and the choices of what you can do with your life. Usually it ends with a mom who's lost a son talking about the pain that's caused. Uh, and if you could see what occurs, and at the end of the night, uh, these young individuals sit down and eat dinner uh, with the police and the like. Uh, and a combination of the gun enforcement was first in those precincts, then we added 6, 8, and 12. And so how's it working? Here are the precincts that didn't have ceasefire on homicide last year. They rose 4%. Here are the precincts that had ceasefire. Dropped 26%. On the non-fatal shootings, the precincts that didn't have ceasefire were okay, down 8%. The precincts that had ceasefire, down 15%. This program is working. So in January, we extended to precincts 4 and 7. And by the end of this year, we're going to go into every precinct. We know what the strategy is, but it's a person-by-person -person decision. And the partnership with the clergy is absolutely critical. The partner with the job training program is absolutely critical. And every month, five or six of these kids go to community college and get a job. One of them is cooking now at a downtown restaurant. Another one's a supervisor on an assembly line. There's a lot of talent, and we're doing our best to get them going in the right direction. And then, of course, uh, green light. Uh, 300 businesses in the last two years. And so now we're starting to develop corridors. So instead of all those individual flashing green lights, you're going to more and more see entire corridors with the more subdued uh, kind of lighting. Uh, and these cases are being monitored real time uh, at police headquarters. And almost every week we get a case where somebody gets a license plate, a shooter, an ID off of one of these, and we have taken off in the last month carjackers, armed robbers in several cases because this is working. And since it's gone live two years ago, carjackings, which was our target. We had 516. This is 303. This isn't just a green light station. This is across the city. We've seen a 40% reduction in carjackings. So to those uh, uh, individuals who have been out there uh, the neighbors have been great. You don't have to explain to the public the value of this. Green light costs eight or ten bucks a day to a business. If you already got a cable, it's five or six bucks a day. And so the neighbors have gone out to some of these troubled places and have helped persuade these communities, uh, these different businesses to do it. Uh, we're probably going to have 500 by the end of the year, uh, and we think we're going to make a difference. We've got another 141 DPD positions in the budget that I hope will be adopted uh, in the next couple of weeks by city council. 150 officers being trained in the police academy. They'll be on the street protecting us. We're putting them into the green light. We're putting them in to cease fire. Uh, and we can do this uh, if we stay with this program. So to Chief Craig uh, and all the men and women of the Detroit Police Department, thank you for all that you're doing. Something that I know everybody on this stage shares with me 
is to make sure that those who stayed in Detroit, we're going to talk about those who stayed, can stay in their homes. Uh, and we remember this incident well that happened in Griswold in 2013, when not only did the last administration support it, but the council voted a tax abatement uh, to uh, move out what had been subsidized housing. Uh, and this is a woman I met uh, by the name of Stella Buchanan, who was in that property, got pushed out. Uh, Ms. Buchanan lived most of her life in Detroit, graduated from Southeastern, worked at uh, DPS, I mean, worked at uh, DPS, worked at Chrysler, retired, got her a little apartment in Detroit. 48 years, evicted from Griswold, moved to the Industrial Senior Building. Now, when the HUD credits expire, usually they're for 15 or 30 years, the owner of the building is entitled to move the subsidized renters out and put new people in. That happened to her at Griswold. She went to the industrial building on Washington. They told her credits ran out. She could be moving again. And as she said to me, I came downtown when there was nothing but me and the pigeons. <laughs> she said, there was nothing here. Now we got parks at Campus Martius and at, uh, 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 what's the other, uh, Beacon, Beacon Place, where I can go and listen to uh, music. I can go over to uh, Avalon and get a salad. I can go to Tim Hortons and get a coffee. I got people on the street. And now it feels like the city I love is pushing me out. We said, that can't happen. And so Arthur Jemison and our team went and sat down with the folks at Industrial Senior Building, great partners in the Roxbury Group. Uh, and said, we got a new policy. We're not going to move people out so others could move in. And they agreed, and we got a commitment that Ms. Buchanan and all 127 of her uh, fellow citizens will be able to stay in that apartment at low rent through the year 2047. <laughs> so is, is Stella Buchanan here? Ms. Buchanan? Thank you. You told me you plan to stay the whole 30 years. So we got that building done, and then we said, but this is happening all over the city. We could have a couple of thousand of these. So we went to Village Center and extended theirs, and then we went to Ryan Court and extended theirs till 2046, and then to Restoration Towers in northwest Detroit till 2031, and this one till 2031. Uh, Rivercrest out on the east side near me at 2046. Building owner by building owner, most were great in wanting to do this, but we're saying to folks, for the next 30 years, you can be sure that you can stay here. And one of the most interesting is, this one, Milner, was never a subsidized property, bought by Broder and Saxe. These are guys I gave a little bit of difficulty to about that apartment on Griswold. Um, and they came to me and said, we just bought this apartment. And I said, that's not HUD subsidized. You don't, there's no rules here. They said, we want to set a different standard. And even though we're using our own money to renovate it, it's not HUD subsidized, I want you to know every person in this apartment making less than $40,000 a year when we're done renovation is going to have that apartment at a subsidized rate for the rest of their lives. So we're starting to build a different culture. 1,772 people like Stella Buchanan now know their homes are protected for anywhere from 15 to 30 years because you stayed and we're gonna make sure that you know that you're valued. But keeping what we have uh, isn't enough. And so we need to build more units. Uh, and so we made a commitment uh, and now uh, with the support in particular of uh, Council Member Sheffield, uh, you wanna build a new unit with our support, 20% has to be affordable. And so this beautiful building in Midtown, 40% of the units are affordable. And this on the riverfront, another 20%. Uh, this is going up right now in the new center area at 20%. The Traymore Apartments, 28 units in Midtown, 100% affordable. And so I went to the opening of the Traymore, uh, and I got a chance to meet a fellow who came and talked to me uh, by the name of Antonio McClurp. And he came up and he says, well, I want you to meet my daughter. He's got seven-year-old Amira, Amira and six-year-old Alyssa. And he says, I grew up in Detroit, but I care about my daughters. I share custody with their mom. I pick them up from school every day. They stay with me two days a week. I need to have a place that they can be proud of. He works as a valet at the Motor City Casino. And so he says, I was in the suburbs. He says, but I wanted to be in the city. I wanted to be by where I worked. He says, and when I found these affordable houses, these affordable apartments at the Traymore. 
that I can have this beautiful place in Midtown Detroit and bring my daughters to be close to work and be proud. He says, I came back home. And so we may have lost 244,000, but we got three back. Antonio, are you and Amira and Alyssa here? Welcome back. This is the city that we're working to build. 600 new affordable units already, and now we're going on to raise $250 million to save 10,000 more units that are coming up in the coming years, like Stella Buchanan's, to build 2,000 more. And we've already identified $50 million in city funds. We're raising $50 million in philanthropic funds, and we're going for low-interest loans so that uh, people like major foundations can make a low-interest loan the builder can borrow at low interest and pass those savings along in subsidized rates. We believe we can raise this. This is what city, a city needs to do if you're going to build a city that's meant for everybody. The other thing is uh, we're going to need the affordable housing for all the jobs moving back, right? So Detroit's unemployment rate was 28% in 2009. And CNN did a study uh, that said uh, that uh, uh, your solution, if you lived in Detroit and you wanted a job, that was their solution. Move. 29% unemployment rate, you don't have a chance. I was working at DMC at the time. We were one of the few people hiring. I would do the um, orientation of the new employees every month. And the stories were amazing. I worked at a factory. Uh, auto plant for 20 years, got laid off, took my buyout and went to nursing school, became a nurse. I worked at a bank at the bank teller and as a bank teller and the branch closed. Uh, and when it did, uh, I went and learned to run an MRI machine. What you had to do in 2009 to get a job in this city was heroic. And so that was what CNN had to say. But uh, three years out of bankruptcy, things are a little different because those who stayed have seen some remarkable things. Fifth Third Bank moving their headquarters in with 300 jobs. Ally Bank with 1,400 jobs. Microsoft opening in the city of Detroit. The two largest seat makers in America, Lear, opened their new design center uh, in Capitol Park, and Adyen moving its headquarters from Milwaukee right across from Cobo Hall to be part of the city. So the major businesses started to come downtown, but now we see them starting to spread out a little bit. So the old abandoned Redford High School, you remember this, is now a Myers, employing 275 people. And Southwestern High School, terribly abandoned, left Western as the only DPS school in, in uh, this part of Detroit. It's now a new 500 employee auto parts plant making parts for Ford and GM cars uh, called Sakti. Uh, this abandoned site on Rosa Parks uh, is now a healthcare warehouse employing 140 people. These are the jobs that are moving in. This abandoned I-94 industrial park, something that Scott Benson played a key role in, uh, is now a 500,000 foot warehouse with 150 jobs. And right next door in an abandoned warehouse, a steel company, ArcelorMittal, just opened a new plant last week with another 125 workers. Uh, in southwest Detroit, not far from here, 200,000 square foot logistics center. This happened in the last three years. Ford, moving 220 employees into Corktown. Do you ever think you see the day all these folks are moving in? And Flexingate is going to be the largest parts plant in the city in 20 years uh, over on the I-94 corridor in the highest unemployment area in the city. In the last four years, we've had more than 25 companies of 100 to 500 jobs move into the city. We have not seen this type of movement in the city in decades. It's been going the other way, right? Uh, so... So now, here's a question, a question that everybody up here asks every day. We got all these companies coming back. Who's going to get the jobs? And you know what my answer is going to be? How about the people who stayed, right? Uh, can we, as a city, give the priority to the people who stayed? And so, uh, here's what we have done. And we're centering all of the activity, for those of you who stayed, into something we call Detroit at Work. All of the job training programs are set in one place. We've taken the CEOs of every major company that is hiring in Detroit. 
They're all on the board saying, these are the jobs we need filled now. And if you'll train for them, we'll hire Detroiters. They say, well, okay, what kind of jobs are you talking about? Well, I can tell you this, today, 4,000 jobs open today The Detroit at Work can place you in, can train you for, in order to fill them. And so, here's one, healthcare. Uh, DMC, St. John's, Henry Ford, couldn't train their nurse assistants in their techs. So I said to them, okay, I'll tell you what, if you'll commit to hiring 240 Detroiters, we'll train them. We went to Oakland University Nursing School, and, and they operated at Focus Hope over on Davison, over on Oakman uh, near Davison. And we have now had 110 people graduate the four- to nine-week class. Ninety-one percent of the first two classes have already been placed, and I go to the graduations, and it is so powerful to hear these individuals saying, I was unemployed. Uh, I learned so much in this training. And once you get in as a nurse assistant, you can do so many things in healthcare. You can go into research. You can go in uh, to, you can become an RN. You can go in uh, to imaging. There's all kinds of opportunities, and I say to them when they graduate, in this world today, you earn what you learn. And so you start out in a 13 or 14 hour, hour job with benefits, that's all right. But go pick up some other skills and you'll be in to one level after another. That's what we're trying to build here. Transportation training. Uh, we're running training programs uh, for drivers. We've hired 55 through this program at DDOT, like Sean Martin, who you saw on the earlier. Another 100 snowplow and road patching drivers have been hired through the program. 91 over the road truckers. We can't fill these positions, they're available now. 275 people we have trained and placed at Myers, and another Myers is coming down in Lafayette Park. We're going to have more of these opportunities. Uh, somebody likes Myers. All right. Uh, in technology, uh, 29 trainees have been placed at Quicken for people who have skills on the tech side, and they can't hire enough. Manufacturing, DMS over at 96 in Southfield, already 236 employees. So whatever kind of job is in your heart, there's a good chance that we have the training program for you. And now we're training for the 400 jobs at Flexigate. So the other thing we're doing is we are doing everything we are legally allowed to do to give preference to Detroiters. And so I'm a lawyer. We stay within the bounds of the law. But within those bounds, I'm going to make sure every chance I can, Detroiter gets a job. So if you go to work at Flexigate, the city of Detroit is going to pay for your training. Uh, if you're from someplace else, they can get somebody else to pay for it, but we're paying for the Detroiters, all right? So here's what we've done. Uh, you'll be glad to know that in 2018, Ron Brundage and DPW are going to resurface 88 miles of road, do $90 million in road improvement. Anybody run across any potholes? All right. Ron's doing a great job at the paving, but here's the other piece. Every one of those $90 million contracts are going to be required that 51% of the work performed be done by Detroiters. We're going to use our purchasing power to get jobs for our residents. Gary Brown in the Water Department is going to do $400 million in water and sewer improvements. You're seeing fewer and fewer water main breaks, but they've been neglected for a long time. And we got a lot of work to do. And when they do those $400 million in improvements, 51% of all the work will be done by Detroiters. We're going to do $2 billion work on the Gordie Howe Bridge being driven by the Canadians. Now, I couldn't get the Canadians to agree to hire 51% Detroiters. I tried. Rich Baird was in the room. But we got a compromise. They wrote us a $10 million check to train Detroiters ourselves so they'd be ready for the jobs at the bridge. And I thought that was a pretty fair compromise. Uh, Dan Gilbert just broke ground on the Hudson site. Billion dollar construction project for three years. And he has to have 51% of the work be done by Detroiters. Now we know today we don't have enough construction workers in this town to make the 51%. They're not going to make it. So why do we do this? Let me show you. We put the same requirement in for Little Caesars Arena. We knew there was no way they could make it, but you know what they did? 
Detroiters worked 700,000 construction hours on that arena. Pretty remarkable. It was only 25% of the work. 350 Detroiters got jobs as apprentices, which means they're on their way for a career for the rest of their lives. They got launched, 350 people on their career because of Little Caesars Arena. And after all of that, the Illiches still had to pay $5 million in fees because they didn't hire enough. It wasn't for lack of effort. And so uh, in the past, the city was in the fee collection business. Uh, Brenda Jones is, says, why are we in the fee collecting business? Let's take this money that we're getting, let's put it back into the training. And so we are taking every dollar that these folks are paying, and we are putting it into training. We're putting it in Randolph. Remember I showed you Randolph earlier, where the 300 kids are there? Well, here's what we're doing. The kids go home. We're using the equipment, the space, we're using $5 million to hire trainers, and 300 adults are coming into that class to learn skilled trades in the same building. These are the ways that we can use our leverage. We got great partners. The Plumbers Union uh, and the Carpenters and Millwrights are actively recruiting uh, um, apprentices from the city of Detroit. And we know that historically, men and women of color uh, have not always been welcomed in all the trades. And so we are using the purchasing power uh, involved in all these construction projects to say things need to change. And you've seen some visionary leadership at the plumbers and the carpenters. Visionary leadership says, we know. And they're out recruiting. And we're going to keep pushing until every single trade has completely opened their doors uh, to residents of our city. Now, I have been amazed at how many times we get somebody to go through training. They can't get to their job because they got $2,000 in driver responsibility fees. This was an ill-conceived idea to balance the budget 10 years ago. Uh, and you had 76,000 Detroiters and 350,000 people in Michigan couldn't drive because of these fees. They paid their fines on their tickets. What are you doing? You're causing people to be unemployed. This is crazy, right? I mean, how does this help the economy? And so we pushed a statewide coalition for change. I was a big part of an effort to say, we need to get off of this. Uh, and the Michigan legislature has just acted to rescind the driver responsibility fees in this state October 1st. All right? And so, if you have fees, driver responsibility fees, go to the Secretary of State's office. If you're already in a payment plan, you can get it canceled right now. If you're not in a payment plan, you can get it canceled October 1st. But you go to the Secretary of State's office and they'll help you. I want to thank some of the people who've been advocating for a very long time for this. Senator Morris Hood, State Senator Ken Horn, Representative Leslie Love. Uh, and I want to thank the people who helped push it over the finish line. One of them's here today, Speaker Tom Leonard, uh, along with uh, Arlen Meekhoff, Governor Rick Snyder. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for your role. So you see what we're doing? We're chipping away at these barriers, one after another, so that we can get Detroit residents to work. What if you're a returning citizen? Uh, and I hear this all the time. Uh, I can't get hired. It is remarkable what's happening now. Because the labor market is so tight, we are seeing a significant change in attitudes. We have 25 companies that are right now saying to Detroit at work, we'll hire returning citizens today. All right. Sakti, the company over on the old Southwestern High School site the, with the plant, has hired 200 returning citizens themselves. Uh, and so, and, and what the CEO tells me at Sakti is, uh, when you hire a returning citizen, they know that if they lose a the job, it's going to be hard to get another one. They tend to be your most reliable workers, on time, show up even when they're not feeling well. We're building our company on them. We've got a lot of talent here. And so if you go to Detroit at work as a returning citizen, uh, we will steer you to the training. And if you've got one felony more than five years ago, we'll help you with expungement services so you can get a clean record. Because here's the thing. I went with the governor to Japan to try to convince Foxconn, uh, the people who make the iPhones, to put their uh, plant in Detroit or somewhere in Michigan. 
You know what the big question was? Where are you going to get the workers? We were pitching Amazon to come here. And there's a lot of factors going on. You know what the number one question was? Where are you going to get the workers? This is now a competitive issue. That the city of Detroit, we need everybody. We need the talented people who have been out of the workforce to come back in so we can go after and land these big companies. You won't believe the people who are talking about one coming here. And everybody says the same thing. Can you deliver the workers? And so Detroit at work is going to be there, ready. But for you, you got to do the hard part. you got to make the phone call. you got to get started. Uh, and it's scary learning a new skill at a new job. But if you'd have done it in 2009, you almost surely would have been unemployed. If you do it today in the city of Detroit because you stayed, there's a very good chance you'll be launched on a new career. So what if you want to start your own company? Well, if you want to start a company, you ought to be in the city of Detroit. There's no place that supports new business startups. And uh, we saw these companies coming in, and I had a group of folks come in, probably 50 or 60, uh, African-American and Latino entrepreneurs. And they said, we like the fact that Ally Bank's coming back, and we like the fact Microsoft's coming back, but what about us? We stayed here. And a lot of times, we don't have family wealth to go to to start up our business. We don't have the banking relationships. Uh, can you do something to create an atmosphere that Detroiters and entrepreneurs of color who have good business plans, who are hard workers, who are talented, can get, some, can get an opportunity? And so... Uh, we went to uh, Lejeune Tabron at the Kellogg Foundation, and Jamie Dimon, the president of the largest bank in America, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. And we said, as government, we can't create an entrepreneur college fund. We aren't allowed to make those kinds of distinctions. But as private companies, you could fund something. And so they did. They put in a fund where they made loans of $50,000 to $200,000 to entrepreneurs of color who couldn't get traditional loans. 45 business startups in the last two years, $5 million in loans and not one single default. We've got talented entrepreneurs, they just need a chance. And so I decided Detroit was gonna be the place where you could come to be an entrepreneur. So those are the 45 businesses. Look at how they're spread out around the city. They've already produced 600 jobs. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a story uh, about Melissa Butler. Who here has heard of Melissa Butler? Okay. So, uh, so Melissa Butler grew up in Detroit, went to Cass Tech, uh, got, got out of town, and went to Wall Street, making a lot of money on Wall Street. Uh, and she realized that the kinds of variation in colors and materials and lipstick wasn't out there. So I have no idea why a Wall Street banker does this, but she starts making lipstick in her kitchen. And then she starts selling it on the internet. And it starts to catch on. She ends up, but she's in New York. And she doesn't have anybody there to help her. She goes on Shark Tank. Pitches Shark Tank. People on Shark Tank said, you're nuts. Nobody wants purple lipstick. They blew her off. She said, I don't want to be in New York. But she says, I hear there's an entrepreneurial climate back in Detroit. She moves back home. Comes back to the city and says... I think I can do this. Gets a lot of support. Business takes off on the internet. Target calls. And Target says, we're going to put you in 42 stores. We want to order 40,000 tubes of lipstick and lip gloss. Now, Melissa says, I can't make 40,000 tubes in my kitchen, right? <laughs> this is where entrepreneurs fail. She needed a loan. She needed the money to go out and buy these 40, make these 40,000 tubes. And she turned to the Entrepreneur Color Fund, a place where a bank never would have given a loan. They got her $75,000 loan. They sold out her lipstick at all kinds of the targets. Now they're ordering more. She's got a million dollars a year in sales. And she says, my next thing is it's going so fast. I'm going to have to open up a lipstick manufacturing company here in the city of Detroit, hiring Detroiters. But here's the thing. If Melissa Butler had stayed in New York, she would have never had that long. She came to a Detroit, a place where we support our entrepreneurial spirit. And because of that, uh, the whole world's going to hear about her. Please give a warm welcome to Melissa Butler. Welcome home.
And we're doing this on a, a smaller scale in a lot of different ways. But so my friend Jamie Dimon, who's J.P. Morgan Chase, has been phenomenal. They've invested $150 million in the city. I was in New York with him. He was giving a speech bragging about the Entrepreneur Colors Fund. He said there were zero loan, zero defaults. He says, a great record. I said, well, Jamie, it's a $6 million fund. If it's zero defaults, there ought to be more money. <laughs> he got together with their partners, and they tripled the fund amount to $18 million. So there's going to be three times as many <laughs> Melissa Butlers. And every quarter, we do the same thing with Motor City Match. Grants of $50,000. We pick 10 winners every quarter all over the city. Now uh, we've already got uh, $5 million in grants, 33 businesses have been open, overwhelmingly Detroiters uh, and men and women of color, uh, 32 more under construction, 40 more, all off of just Motor City Match. Do you see how we're layering these different business strategies? But you know what? You can go to any place else. There ain't any Motor City Match. Entrepreneur Colors Fund, uh, they just started it in San Francisco and New York after our success. So you can go out to San Francisco or New York now. <laughs> Who would have thought San Francisco and New York are coming to us to figure out how to do entrepreneurial financing? Uh, but if you want to be in Michigan to be an entrepreneur, you want to be in the city of Detroit. I want to do a special thank you uh, to three city departments with extraordinary accomplishments. Uh, it's a little bit off the vision uh, discussion, but I just felt it was important. Uh, and the first, I want to say something about the Detroit Fire Department. Uh, we have seen... We have seen arsons in this city drop 30% in the last four years. The demolitions have a lot to do with it. The arson investigators have a lot to do with it. And so you got got firefighters. they got 37% fewer fires to go to. What do we do? In other places, you'd be talking about cutting back and laying off. But our firefighters stepped forward and said, we want to be trained as medical first responders. And now, every one of our firefighters is being trained, and that's Mike Nevin, the union president. You want to talk about a major shift in the union in the city. Uh, they were first on the scene 16,000 times last year. So now when you call 911, if one of our 25 ambulances closest to you, they get there first. If one of our 40 firehouses is closer to you, our fire trucks get there first and stabilize you. And as a result of this partnership, we now have the EMS response times down to the national average. And so thank you to the men and women of the Detroit Fire Department for what you've done. Hundred thousand rides a week in 2017. They added 1,500 trips, uh, and these are pretty remarkable numbers. They're adding another 300 trips in 2018. We got 30 new buses coming in 2018. Uh, Warren Evans is here, and he's done a great job, as far as I'm concerned, in trying to put together a regional plan that I hope this region has a chance to vote on. But. But other counties may choose to do what they want, but I can tell you this, we got a whole lot of jobs coming into the city, and I'm going to make darn sure we're running first-class bus system so within our city we can move people there until the climate is right, that we finally see that we're a region. We're competing against Pittsburgh and Indianapolis and Chicago for these jobs. We need to start to think and function like a region. So in the meantime, we're going to build up DDOT and to the, the bus drivers, the mechanics who have done such a great job with these record numbers, thank you for a very successful year. Uh, 2017 was the third straight balanced budget. Uh, and when council acts, we are going to be out of active state oversight this spring, uh, about 30 years ahead of schedule. Uh, and i got to tell you, uh, in dealing with city council for the last three years, we have been completely unified. This hasn't been something where they were trying to spend money and I was fighting them. Uh, these council members have been vigilant about saying we're going to have a balanced budget each and every year. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the day. New York City uh, stayed in state oversight for 30 years after they came out. Uh, we're out in three years, which is something that I'm very proud of. And I don't know how many times it's going to take, but I am going to stay with this until we get the car insurance cut. Yeah. 
We got really close this time. And I want to say a special thank you because the pressure that came down from extremely well-funded trial lawyers and hospitals was overwhelming. But I want to say to Senator Ian Conyers, Representative Leslie Love, Representative Betty Cook Scott, Representative Sylvia Santana, Representative Wendell Byrd, thank you for standing strong. And I am hearing now that there are rapidly increasing car insurance rates in the inner ring of suburbs. And this is, almost all of the legislators in that ring right around us voted against this. They thought it was a Detroit problem. I got a feeling their constituents uh, are going to let them... Uh, going to let them know, but we're going to come back at it this year, we're going to come back at it next year. We've had great support from people like Lana Tice and Tom Leonard and uh, uh, Representative Chatfield, a whole group in Lansing. We were within a few votes this time. We're going to stay with it until we get there. Uh, and you remember that I ran on something where I said every neighborhood uh, has a future. And so I'm going to finish by closing with the neighborhoods. You remember what's January? This is the paper from the London Daily Mail. London, England wants to write about Detroit's 40,000 abandoned houses. Well, with our partner with the governor and the state of Michigan, uh, we've demolished nearly 14,000 of them. We were helped enormously when Senator Debbie Stabenow pushed through another $250 million funding in Washington, which has been critical to this, and we owe her enormously for that. But it's 14,000 down. There was a time I thought we take these 40,000, we do 8,000 a year, it'll be done in five years. Um, I feel really bad about all the people who got in trouble because I pushed them to try to do 8,000 a year. Uh, but the truth is, with our contractor capacity, uh, we can't do it. And so here's the plan that we're going to do. We're going now four times rate of any other city in America, and those blue dots are the 14,000 we've taken down. When we take them down, we sell the vacant lot to the next door neighbors. They stayed, right? They live next to it. And so for 100 bucks, these are my favorite days of the year, the side lot fairs, where the neighbors leave with their deeds. 9,000 neighbors who stayed bought a side lot, and now they got room for a swing set or a garden or a yard or the like, because this is the people that we want to benefit. But since I know it's going to take us some time to get through them, uh, Brad Dick and his crew have started up board up brigades. And we've now boarded up 5,000 houses in the last six months. And the thing I'm most proud of, we've sold more than 3,000 houses on buildingdetroit.org. Uh, this is the auction center. If you haven't checked it out, it's worth doing. Those are the houses. 3,000 vacant houses that families have moved into now. Can you imagine what that meant to 3,000 blocks? how much it stabilized the community. Because our goal is to save every house that we can. And so uh, here's a house that had been vacant for five years, and there's how it looks today. Right. So this is what we've done 3,000 times. And how would you like to be next door when it gets fixed up? But we also have to prevent new vacancies. And that means stopping the foreclosure. We have to stop the folks from leaving. And so in 2014, the law of the state said that if the treasurer uh, wanted to give you a break on your back taxes, he had to charge you 18% interest. It was crazy. Nobody wanted it. I went up to Lansing and led an effort with a rep by the name of Phil Cavanaugh from Detroit at the time, and we passed a law that said the treasurer can set up a four- to five-year payment plan at six months. And our treasurer, Eric Sabri, is like a miracle worker at pushing it. All right? He's everywhere. He doesn't want to take your house. All right? And so then we took people like Ted Phillips, the United Community Housing Coalition, and 15 groups. And you know what they did? These are your neighbors. They went out and knocked on the doors of every single person who was up for foreclosure. And they said, you have help. It's here. Come down and see the treasurer. And when they did that, here's what happened. In 2015, you had 6,400 people who owned their homes that got foreclosed on. It was heartbreaking. And then last, in 2016, it was cut in half. But last year, with the full effect of this program, we were down to 786. <laughs> and we are out now going house to house, person to person. You do not have to lose the house. We want you to stay. And so if 
you have got to notice you know somebody who was. They should act by April 1st. If you want to pay back taxes, uh, I know Eric will be glad to take them online. Uh, but if you want a payment plan, the treasurer will work with you and put you in a program you can afford. And if you're a renter and they stuck that foreclosure notice on your door, you're paying your rent and that landlord ain't paying their taxes, we got a program for you that when the landlord gets foreclosed on, you can buy the house and move in. So call that number. And so for the 22,000 that we have left, here's the plan. In the next two years, we're going to demolish about 8,000 with the money that Senator Stavenow got us. We're going to sell another 2,000 in the land bank. Owners, we think we'll renovate another 1,000. We're going to board up 11,000. And so by the end of 2019, every single abandoned house in this city is going to be either demolished, renovated, or boarded. That's my commitment. And then the last piece is to build on these neighborhoods. Uh, so it's good to fill in the houses. And so two years ago, I told you we're going to start a $30 million strategic neighborhood fund for Illinois McNichols, West Village, and Southwest. Well, we got $42 million, and we did all of that. Uh, and I want to thank our partners at J.P. Morgan and Kresge and the group who did it because it took an area like West Village and continued to build on it uh, and just opened the coal right next door to Agna Street. Uh, over at 7 in Livernoy, B. Siegel's been vacant as long as I can remember. Now being rebuilt for shopping and apartments out of the Strategic Neighborhood Fund. And right here at Western High School, all right, uh, around the corner, the folks from Western know this on Porter, called the Murray. These row houses have been abandoned for probably 20 years. They will be fully renovated by the Strategic Neighborhood Fund in the next year and be occupied. And then, Western folks, you look out your front door across Clark Park, uh, and we're going to have a gathering place with new shopping and residential at the corner of Clark uh, and Verner. That's what the first wave did. And we said if we could do it in the first wave, you know what? The investors are making money. We said, all right, let's do some more. So now we're going for $125 million, and we're going to add seven more neighborhoods. So all of these areas across the city, we're going to start to extend these efforts. So what you'll see is a neighborhood that looks like that is going to get renovated to that. And this stretch will look like that. And that stretch will look like that. This is what we're going to do. So think about what you, you got. Most of us who have been in the city remember the days when you would walk up to the store and you could get a cup of coffee, you get a gallon of milk, you could uh, get things because the storefronts were there. You walked to them. If we're going to bring the neighborhoods back, we've got to bring the commercial storefronts back. Yes. And so we're going to put $125 million together to do that. And we're going to do all of these projects. And these are the planning meetings that are going on right now. And we're going to do it with the Detroiters who stayed. Those who stayed are going to have the say in what happens in their neighborhood. And so to the people of this city, um, uh, and just deeply uh, honored uh, the confidence you gave in me uh, this last election. And I told you, the first four years, we were going to try to fix the survey, get the grass cut in the park, get the streetlights on. I'm not talking about that stuff anymore. Now we're talking about building one Detroit for all of us. And we're going to do it together. God bless you and good evening. <laughs>